Uh, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. Welcome to Fulbright at 75, celebrating a legacy of global friendships. Greetings. Thank you for attending session on storytelling and social consciousness. My name is Jay Nathan. I'm professor of international business and strategy at St. John's University, uh, New York City. And I'll be your moderator. It's a pleasure and honor to be uh, doing this for this exciting session. And if you would like, and please have your location and type in your questions on the chat for the panelists and uh, the um, about your Fulbright grant, where did it do? And so both the location and your Fulbright grant are important so that we know uh, who we have in the audience. So I will be introducing in the order of um, the speakers list. Our first presenter will be Jonathan Goodman-Levitt and he will talk about global friendships and social change through film. And followed by, we will have Carol and Carol Sterling. She will talk about successful strategies using the arts and puppets in working with host institutions in global education. And the next presenter will be Karen Widely with um, co-presenter Michelle Kud and they will be presenting on the arts-based resilience building with young women in the global south. And the fourth presenter, another interesting presentation, Manalini Watson will speak on viewing syncretization or syncretism in India's border uh, stage through folk music and folk tales. So, I have the floor to Jonathan Levitt. Jonathan, please. Hello, everyone. I am um, really pleased to be here today. And I'm going to share uh, some moments, memories, and connections about storytelling and social consciousness with you. As a jumping off point, I'd like to share a one minute teaser from our most recent project, Being Bibi, about the Cameroonian drag performer, Bibi Zahara Benet making her way as an artist in New York and Minneapolis in the United States. It's a film directed by Emily Branham that Emily and I produced with Mark Smolowitz. Munir, if you'd like to go to the first clip, one minute long. I'm just a male who can perform the duties which are generally allocated for the female sex. <laughs> Bibi Zahara Benet is with us, and you know she won the first RuPaul's Drag Race. It was just God's gift to the world. God's gift to us first, then the world. Yeah. I traveled many, many miles away for my family and friends to pursue a dream, and I will not stop until I've reached the end of my journey. Isn't it so interesting, like, how beautiful I looked back then, and then now even, like, way more beautiful? No, I'm telling you. <laughs> so, um, as many of you might realize, that's uh, a very good film for a Fulbright Association audience. And indeed, we had a group uh, attend on Sunday's screening in New York. And um, one of my new friends who's on the panel, Carol Sterling, actually came. Uh, can we put up the, the photo um, of uh, photo one? Thanks, Munir. Uh, when you get the chance to put that up, it's a photo taken on um, Sunday. Uh, and then you can flip from photo one to photo two, please. Thanks. And this is a group of uh, current Fulbrighters who attended 
the uh, event on Sunday, uh, among many other current Fulbrighters. I, I just wanted to share, and we can turn back to the, uh, the main screen if you like, but uh, something that one of the current Fulbrighters um, sent to our board. Uh, uh, this person said, I told Jonathan before that I did not have the chance to know Bibi or her work. Uh, thanks to the event, I know her story and talking with her in person was just so inspiring. She's such a deep person with an artist's soul. And when I asked her how she was able to overcome all the challenges, she said, you just have to know your gift. And uh, this person was obviously very moved by Bibi's story. And, you know, sometimes it takes a drag performer from Cameroon living and working in the States uh, to move somebody from halfway around the world in Europe uh, who happens to be studying the States or anywhere else really for that matter. So it's the transformative power of stories that lifts our social cons consciousness uh, and makes other people aware of uh, how it's possible to live in the world either for themselves or for others. Um, when we think about stories, uh, they also exist behind every artwork and to inspire uh, that artwork. In terms of uh, my own interest uh, in LGBTQIA plus stories about human rights, uh, which is one reason why I got involved in this project about BB. Uh, you know, I take that back to stories that I was told when I was a teenager as well, uh, studying in New Jersey at the governor's school in the middle of high school. Uh, they, um, the organizers of that program brought an AIDS patient to meet with us in 1993. And that exposure really opened me up to um, understanding that I hadn't really considered at that point so, you know, what film does, uh, because everyone doesn't have the opportunity to meet everyone themselves, of course, uh, film offers a second degree opportunity to meet people and to go to places that you wouldn't otherwise go and that who you wouldn't ordinarily get to meet in your life. And to create those emotional experience for people, there are almost necessarily also relationships behind the camera that are responsible for the access that you get in the first place as a filmmaker that you can then share with audiences. So for filmmakers, you have a unique and privileged position to experience these people in places in a unique and uniquely intimate way that even most people who are the intimates of intimates uh, do not get to experience because of the special nature of that experience. And you know, what I'd like to do now is go back in time in, in my career to my first feature, Sunny Intervals and Showers, which is about a marriage and a family uh, where they were coping with the father's manic depression as it was referred to more generally at the time or bipolar disorder as it's referred to now. Um, basically what I did on my Fulbright uh, scholarship in 1999 was uh, continue research that uh, I'd done uh, at Oxford Psychiatry when I was a budding psychologist in training previously in 1997. And what I wound up deciding to do is follow a family of five in the year following the father's diagnosis with bipolar disorder. So um, I'd like to go to the second clip. Uh, we can go on to the full screen now, if you'd like, you. Munir. And um, this is a clip before we start it, just have a couple more words. This is, um, a, you know, near the, nearing the end of this film, basically when, um, this couple had been dealing for about a year with a real challenge in their marriage, a challenge for them, a challenge for their three children. And uh, earlier that day, um, they'd been in court discussing divorce proceedings. So if we can play the clip now for about two minutes, I'll tell you when to stop, Munir. I'm sleeping on the floor. I probably Good. did shout her that she's not coming back in the bedroom. You can climb down the tree, and she did. I never expected, though, that it would become part of the divorce petition. I thought Simon was just going to come here a second. Even more of a shock, I was accused of physical and mental abuse of my children. I wish it wasn't happening, Simon. But it does seem to me, doesn't it? And I wish it was different. Hmm? But there doesn't seem to be any way of making it different, I'm afraid the more I've tried as, much, as hard as I possibly can. Okay. Can I remind you the conversation came here with you, please? Well, no, 
I need to I'm remind only, you. I need to remind I'm only you in about favour that. of telling the truth, no, I, to... I didn't start this you whole divorce business. Right. Kate not right. say things to him that he didn't need to know. Jackie, Kate right. doesn't. Kate doesn't. Um, Alan, I'm sorry, but that is not. Kate doesn't actually have any legal power on what people say. This is a free country. You know, it's, it's like a com communist regime. You just sort of close off everything, don't you? I mean, you talk about not listening, but you're not listening to anybody else at the moment. Yeah. Kate can say what yeah. she wants, Jackie. I mean, Kate also said there's no physical abuse, as you know. It's quite clear. If you put a block on what goes in and what goes out, it doesn't reflect real life. Okay. The whole point about this documentary is it's reflecting life. Because I think that life is life, isn't it? Life is life, life is filmed, and life is what goes in the film. Are you feeling a bit intrusive, or I don't know, or what? what? Well, I, I just feel a bit uh, mm -hmm. caught in the middle. But isn't that part of documentary? <laughs> out in April that Jackie had been having an affair with the gardener. Hey, we can there, Munir. We can visit this guy. Thank you. So this is not a place that anyone would have been welcome if not for the special relationship that I had with my film subjects at the time, or as I prefer to refer to them, uh, characters, because we really only have the footage that we record as filmmakers to create a character of in the film. Uh, and I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that both Alan and Jackie, even though they did experience a divorce in the film, uh, both supported the film in distribution. And I remain friends with both of them. Uh, and I'm still friends with Jackie, but Alan sadly died by suicide in 2015 after a very long struggle with bipolar disorder. And I've, I've kept in touch, uh, speaking of global friendships with their three children, as I've watched them grow up as well, and during the pandemic worked on a project with the youngest daughter uh, reflecting on Alan's suicide. And I, I guess I'll close on a memory of uh, making this film in England when I was the only American who many of the people that I was working with knew. Uh, it was 9-11 and we were editing Sunny Intervals and Showers. And really one by one, everybody who was involved on screen in the film called me to offer their condolences, uh, not only to me, but to all Americans in a way. And as Fulbrighters, uh, we're really representatives of our country abroad, as everyone experiencing this conference knows. And you know that experience for me on 9-11 really exemplified you know, the soft diplomacy behind the Fulbright program that's so important um, and that we're all here at this 75th anniversary conference to celebrate. So, you know, that was a day that obviously changed the course of many of our lives. And, um, you know, in my case of what I did next led to the next two features that uh, we made in the decade to come. So um, I think I'll close there. I'm, I hope I'm under 10 minutes. I think I am. And uh, toss mm -hmm. back to Jay. I look forward to answering any questions anyone has. And uh, thank you again for the honor of being here. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. We have plenty of time. We have 20, 25 minutes for Q&A. Next presenter is Carol Sterling, and she will talk about successful strategies using the arts and puppets uh, in working with host institutions in global education. Carol? Thanks, Jay. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. I worked as a Fulbright Program Specialist in Arts Education and Puppetry to bring the K through 12 curriculum alive in two countries, Uganda in 2012 and India in 2015. In each country, I worked with educators to design activities tailored to meet their respective educational needs. I used four strategies. Number one, I invited each host institution to provide input for what learning activities are needed. So during the proposal writing phase, I asked each institution to identify the target audience, which uh, turned out to be kindergarten through 12th 
grade 12 classroom teachers in public schools who work directly with typical children as well as young people in, with special needs. Um, they also advised me that the curriculum that is taught in both of their countries, India and Uganda, is often taught in a kind of boring, un uninteractive way of sort of lecture without opportunities for interactivity. So they asked me if I would please come up with activities that would really engage students interactively. As a consequence of this, I focused on designing socially engaging and small group peer learning activities. Strategy two, prior to departing for each country, I researched online the goals and objectives of each country's K through 12 curriculum. And upon arrival, I asked my host to share with me the texts that are used by subject in each grade. So I became familiar with all the books in English literacy, social studies, science, math, health and hygiene, nutrition and safety. And then I focused on the key concepts, knowledge and skills emphasized in each curriculum area. Using this important information, I developed puppet construction activities and three to five minute ideas for puppet skits that students would create and perform that would teach how to tell stories that reinforce knowledge and skills required in the curriculum. On the screen, Munir is sharing with you some of the students I worked with. This is Robina from Uganda. And these are the materials that she used. These are my friends in the Indian community and they're making puppets out of scrap materials that I'm gonna show you in a minute. Um, Munad, here are some other Indian puppeteers. These are all teachers who are gonna go back into their communities and share the skills that they picked up during my Fulbright experience. And here's another one of my Indian colleagues. Thanks, Munir. And here are some of the puppets that we made. Strategy three, then this is really important. Given the lack of resources for purchase of materials in each country, it was really important to demonstrate that one does not have to spend a lot of money to create art projects that can reinforce the school curriculum. I taught how to use recycled materials to create puppets that can teach concepts in the curriculum. Now I'm gonna share with you a few of those recycled materials. For example, you start with a humble envelope and then you place your hand inside and then you press, press, press. And then you take a marker and you make eyes. And then you take another marker and you make a mouth. And when you have a little more time and your students have time, they make an envelope puppet that looks like this. Hi everybody, I am an envelope and I can tell lots of stories. Another material that we use, I have to put my tops back on, <laughs> um, is you start with a paper plate. Everybody has access to a paper plate you add a stick on the back, and then you teach your students how to add color to the paper plate by adding another piece of colored paper and some fabric. And this puppet can tell all kinds of stories just using the basic materials. The same idea of how to take a paper plate can be made into another kind of puppet by folding it in half and here's one that was made by one of my students where I folded it in half, I added some eyes. I, I can tell you stories about why I brush my teeth. Yes, I can. Another material that we used that was very simple is you start with a paper bag and you can add eyes, nose, mouth, and 
I want to tell you why it's important to only drink water that is clean. Right. And another material that you can simply use is a plastic bottle, put a face on it. And when you have a little more time, add, let me turn him around so you can see his face, add some material. Um, another material that we used was the lowly paper towel roll and covering it with a fabric and paper. Hi, everybody. I am a puppet with flowers growing out of my hair. Wow, that's a good one to start a story off with. Why did I do that? It's an idea for storytelling. Once again, take toilet paper roll, cover it with paper or marker, and you can add hair with a pop stick and some yarn. And boy, do I know how to solve problems with my words. Oh, yes siree. I can tell you stories about conflict resolution. And then finally, we have the lowly sock. We all have one sock that definitely lost its mate in the um, washing machine. You can take that sock, put some eyes on it, put your hand inside it, and <coughs> hi, everybody. I am a sock, but I can tell you all kinds of stories about how we can define words like peppy, woo, woo, woo. And then there's the puppet that's made from a uh, <coughs> sock that tells this story. Wait, it's giving me a little hard time here, but let's see if he can come back out. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Huh. I went to the dentist today and he said, I have lots of cavities. I don't know why. I don't do anything naughty. <laughs> And the dentist said, you've been eating too much bubble gum. Dental health is important, young man. So the last strategy that I wanted to share with you, Munar, you can share this one now, is that in each country, I came up with a project where I wanted my students to get lots of recognition. So we came up with the idea of constructing two giant puppets that would be historically important. Here is in Uganda. We created the first president of Uganda after independence. You can move to the next slide, Munir. And then we marched throughout the campus of McCary University, which is where I did the Fulbright. On the left is Dr. Milton Obote, who was the first Prime Minister of Uganda. And on the right is President Edward Mutesa II. And this was a celebration that not only was about creating and marching through the streets with puppets, but it gave opportunities for the students to do research on why these people were important and what contributions they made to their country. Next slide, please. Here we are. We're about to be interviewed by the press. The students got lots of media attention. It also gave them an opportunity to talk about the value of creating something, an art project that really taught them about the history of their country. Next slide, please. And this was the project that the students in India did. They said they wanted to make a Mother Teresa pro, pro, uh, puppet and we marched through the streets. They were interviewed by the press. So the important thing that I learned from this was that it's very important for the students to get an opportunity to not just research about what's happening in their country, but make it really relevant and then provide an opportunity for them to get the recognition that they deserve. 
So that's my presentation, and I'll look forward to the questions that you have later that I can elaborate on. Thank you, Jay. Oh, thank you, Carol. You got our attention, and the audience are excited. Okay. Our next <laughs> presenter is um, Karen Widely, co-presented with Michelle Kuhn, and they will be talking about the um, <clears throat> arts-based resilience, that is arts-based resilience building with young women in the global south. And take it away, Karen and Michelle. Thank you so much, Jay. And thank you, Carol and Jonathan and fellow panelists. This is a really exciting uh, uh, panel and experience to be part of. Um, I'm Karen Wadley. I was a Fulbrighter to Kenya in 2017, 2018. And I'm with my fabulous co-presenter here, Dr. Michelle Kood, who also was in Kenya uh, during the same time. And we're going to talk about a project that we collaborated on together. Um, and that was uh, one of the, the many valuable things that came from this experience was that Michelle and I uh, met at the pre-departure orientation and we talked about our, our specific interests and had an opportunity to, to work together in country. Um, so for, for my part, I was teaching a theater for development class, uh, using theater as a tool, teaching students how to use theater as a tool for community building, for community engagement, for empowerment and addressing um, social challenges. So I had students from Kenyatta University, which is an urban campus outside of Nairobi. Uh, and we went to be in residency at Nasaruni Academy, which we're gonna hear about uh, more in a moment from Michelle. And the project was to dramatize stories that are very central to an indigenous Kenyan community, using embodied arts, using creative expression, using playmaking, um, and key having the university students as, as main facilitators of, of the project. So now I'll turn things over to Michelle. Thank you, Karen. I echo Karen's welcome and gratitude for this opportunity. Um, really the Fulbright has played such a role in, in our lives and connecting us in this project, hopefully with ongoing uh, in the years ahead as well. So I just wanted to speak a little bit about Nasaruni Academy itself. This is a school of 150 or so girls, a primary school, but we've now begun a high school. And it grew out of a Maasai woman's dream so this was Alice Sayo's dream to give back to her community. She was chosen as a young girl as one who got to have an education. And this was rare, rare and unusual in those times for a girl to be educated. So uh, in response to that, her heart has been uh, so moved that she wants to offer that opportunity to the other young girls in the community surrounding. These are Maasai. They are one of the tribes which was displaced by colonization. And they really are still suffering many of the, um, the ramifications from that. So uh, the Maasai themselves, there's, there's over 40 tribes in Kenya and they're one of the lowest ones socially. So uh, those children when they're in public school are usually ostracized and uh, schools are very far apart for a pastoralist community. It's very difficult to get your uh, girls, especially to be able to travel far enough to get to school. So in addition to that, there were cultural restrictions on educating girls. So all of those factors um, really were, were determinants in keeping a young girl uh, back in the village and uh, recognizing she didn't have much of a role other than to um, grow to about age 13 or 14 and be married off and then begin her whole cycle over again of uh, childbearing, uh, building homes and doing the, the domestic labors and uh, watching over the animals. So um, in order to give girls uh, hope, that they could have something different, something more, that their voice is important, that they themselves are valuable. This is the message of Nasaruni. This is uh, what Alice and her husband Moses, this is their dream. 
So in a short while, we'll share a clip um, of a video that was made about um, this project that took place at Nasaruni. And you'll hear from Moses, um, who is Alice's husband and the director at the school. Um, Nasaruni is, is now a, a haven. That's what the word Nasaruni means in the Maasai language, Kima. And uh, it's a haven sheltering them from the effects of poverty and this traditional um, cultural practice of marrying girls off. So just take a moment to um, watch this film and, and see some of the positive ways Nasaruni is upholding their culture. And you'll see their stories are encapsulated with drama um, with these students from Kenyatta and, and their professor who was Karen. So have a look at this clip. Thank you so much, Michelle. I'm just going to share my screen and show a segment of a, a, a bit that was put together while we were in residency. It's about two and a half minutes. Um, and as Michelle said, at first you'll be hearing um, Bishop uh, Moses Sayo speak about the project itself. And then you'll get to hear some of the university students talk about um, their reflections. And, and after it's over, we'll discuss how we saw these sort of multiple levels of resilience building that, that was happening in this project as a way to mitigate some of the high risk factors that, um, that the communities that we are working with um, might experience. So for just one moment while I share my screen. So in Nazaruni, I have got some friends and tell the, our girls the stories and try to tell us what does it mean. <laughs> Look at this one. So that helps a lot to enrich them in their culture because roots are important, history is important. If we erase history, then we are dead. We have nothing to cling on to. Storytelling provides a link to our past and gives us a glimpse of our future. And by this, the children will get to understand their culture. They're becoming courageous, more courageous. They're brave, they can now talk. They, they have opened up their stories. They're telling their stories. They can speak to, us, to, to me now easily. So the reason that theater is such a powerful art form to use in the preservation of stories is because Theater at its base is about storytelling. How do we um, identify who we are as, as human beings and our connection to not only our land, our culture, to other people is how we both self-identify and tell our stories and how we preserve and pass on those stories. And theater being a human to human art form gives us a really wonderful community building experience in the creation of theater itself. Being taught what happened before westernization and being able to experience that through story, storytelling, sorry, has been able to give us a sense of value in our culture. And I think this that is happening here actually enlightens us about going back to our roots and learning our culture so that now we can pass it on to our children. They will feel like they have a responsibility that has been bestowed upon them to be vessels, to carry these stories to the next generations, and they will be the custodians of the story, and thus giving them voices as women, as girls, who will soon become women who will have their families. We're so happy that you that you get an opportunity to hear from the students that were involved, and I think that on a, on a practical level, and just um, as part of, of my my project as a as a Fulbrighter and teaching students about using theater for community engagement, we were having the the students be the main facilitators. Um, like I said, on a practical level, to be able to to use the skills they were learning in the classroom um, in these kind of service projects, but also uh, to to bridge the language gaps. Um, and most importantly, as an opportunity to have the Kenyan youth 
the Kenyan students be main and forefront stakeholders in the project so that myself and Michelle as white Western academics could really be backgrounded um, and just be there to uh, be support but not be taking central uh, central focus. So that was, that was a, a key part of the project for us. But what we also found in doing this little documentary um, was how much the students themselves were also doing their own resilience building. That through this experience of working with the young Maasai women, they were connecting to their own pasts, that they were really interested in learning about the stories that were central to their cultures and trying to um, reframe the narrative so that they weren't seen as just sort of post-colonial, right? That there was a way to sort of reach back into time and bring that past into the present and into the future and really, um, in really uh, singu non-singularly sort of motivated ways that they could in embrace their own backgrounds. Um, and it even had uh, motivated them, Lucy, who you saw in the video, not only did she want to uh, embrace her own storytelling in TC where she's from, but she's also now a master's student at Arizona State doing a theater for engagement with, uh, with youth program. Um, so when we were thinking about resilience building as a protective factor, we were certainly focusing on the girls, which Michelle's going to talk about now, but uh, one of these sort of like amazing byproducts of the project was also seeing it happen in, in the student artists as they reconnected to their own pasts and they, they gained a desire to know their own stories. And that was a very special um, awareness for us that, as Karen said, we weren't, we weren't initially counting on, um, but the collaboration of this project um, truly was among members of different tribes, different cultural groups within Kenya, and the stories of the Maasai were the ones being highlighted. And that in itself, we were told by others um, that were on site, that in itself was a powerful moment. These girls um, and their Maasai culture, the other Maasai at the school, they're not used to being the ones whose uh, culture is being celebrated, whose stories are highlighted. And so that in itself too was, was really a, an awesome uh, awareness for us to, to see um, because we're trying in this project and projects like this to um, take those in the global South um, and especially the Maasai and, and um, people like uh, these girls at Nasaruni who are frequently seen as victims, right? And um, really highlight that their stories so that they regain their voices. And their voice is the, is the center of this narrative and now they're writing their own story. So that's what we do at Nasaruni Academy. That's what this project was all about. And Karen and I are just honored to be able to share it. If you want any more information about it, I'm going to put um, our contact information in the chat, and uh, we'd love to talk more and look forward to hearing your questions at the end. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Karen and Michelle, for the great presentation, as well as forging global friendship with Kenya. Excellent. The next presenter is Mnalani Watson. And she will be speaking on viewing uh, syncretism in India's border states through folk music and folk tales. And here is Manalini for her presentation. Um, okay. Yeah. Good uh, morning, yeah. everyone. Um, Jake and I uh, share my screen. Okay. Yeah, you're on, Manali. All right. I, um, I'm trying to. Sorry, I do know how to do this. Uh, all right. So, um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, uh, or wherever you all happen to be. Uh, thank you for joining us. And I am absolutely delighted to be part of this panel of storytellers. 
um, just bringing us their stories and the stories of um, the people that they had worked with. Um, I was a part of the 2019 uh, Fulbright cohort in India, and I was researching the relevance of Rajasthani folklorist uh, Vijay Dandeta's folk tales. Uh, to see whether they were relevant today. He had written them, he had collected about 800 plus stories from the villagers around uh, where he lived. And he was, he had written, rewritten them with a social consciousness twist. Um, a lot of them were, his stories were about empowerment and inequality, etc. And um, he was addressing issues such as same-sex relationships, um, you know, th things that uh, people are uncomfortable addressing even today. Um, the one, um, so the, um, I, I'm going to, based on my uh, work with, um, the people I, uh, with my consultants in um, Rajasthan. So I, my work was based in Rajasthan and um, I was um, working out of the city of Jodhpur. Um, and um, my work led me to um, see things that introduced me to syncretism. So what is syncretism? Syncretism, uh, I define syncretism uh, or describe it as a fusion of philosophies and practices from different cultures and re religions. For example, example, certain sects of Hindus and Muslims meld practices from both religions into their daily lives. From a broader perspective, Hindus and Muslims are traditionally posited as being oppositional. So it would be anomalous for them to meld religious practices. But in India, especially rural India, blending practices from multiple religions is not anomalous. So is syncretism good or bad? Some people believe syncretism engenders tolerance and promotes harmony. However, others feel it results in a loss of identity and contamination of ideals. So um, part of my, uh, as part of my previous Fulbright project, I had interviewed storytellers from rural Rajasthan, which is on India's Western border with Pakistan. So some of my consultants had been women from the Dhadi community. Uh, they wore ghagras, the traditional Hindu Rajasthani women's attire, were more familiar with Hindu mythology than I was, and referred to God as Bhagwan instead of Allah. Now, dharis can be Hindus, they can be Muslims, or they could be Hindus converted who had converted to um, Islam, uh, you know, many decades ago. Um, and with regard to their appearance, the only possible sign that they might have been Muslims was that most of them wore thabis. That's an amulet. And you can see it on um, her neck. The, she's wearing the thabis there. Um, and it, it's an amulet that usually contains verses from the Quran and worn as a talisman against disease and black magic. Another potential clue to their religious identity was that one of the folk tales concluded with the protagonist, an ordinary villager returning from his quest with a second wife. So looking at the story from a Hindu point of view, I was taken aback by that concluding turn of events. But when, you know, I first heard the story, but on further analysis, I realized it was a completely acceptable conclusion if the protagonist was Muslim. So this example reflects how aspects of the storyteller's culture and traditions are frequently woven into their narratives. So folk music also provides clues about a community's culture. And a folk, so, um, 
a folk song from the Sundarbans area of Bengal. I was studying Bengali last year during um, the shutdown and studying it online. And one of the things we studied was um, Bengali culture uh, through music and their different crafts. And um, one of the songs that was from the Sundarbans area of Bengal refers to Bonobibi, a local deity. Now Bengal is on India's eastern border and that's with Bangladesh, another Muslim country. Uh, so Bonobibi was believed to have traveled on Allah's orders from Medina to the Sundarbans to protect the distressed residents and animals of the forest from the demon king, Dokin Rai. Dokin Rai, sorry, uh, who is half Brahmin sage and half tiger, ruled the Sundarbans area with his mother, Narayani, until Bono Bibi and her twin brother, Shah Zhongli arrived. Then Dokin Rai objected to their presence, but he and his mother lost the battle against Bono Bibi. Uh, after the battle, Bono Bibi was very gracious and agreed to share control of the area. So she was in charge of the inhabited spaces where the villages were, and she gave the Kinrai the jungle. So everything was moving along just fine until one day, a honey collector named Tona wandered into the jungle without offering prayers to the Kinrai. The Kinrai was furious. When Dona realized his folly, he negotiated with the Kinrai. So in exchange for his life and to be able to return home with his boats laden with honey, he agreed to sacrifice his nephew, Duke. After Dona returned home, leaving Duke alone in the forest, Duke began to chant Bonobibi's name, pleading for her protection. And just as the Kinrai was about to pounce on Duke, Bonobibi's brother Shah Zhongli arrived and chased the Kinrai back into the forest. Bonobibi, having saved the boy, then sent him home on her pet crocodile. After he returned home, Duke and his mother were so grateful to, Bono, to Bonobibi, they promoted the worship of Bonobibi throughout the area. Now, Bonobibi is a Muslim Pirani. She is worshipped in Bengal, however, she is worshipped in Bengal in a traditional Hindu manner. Her statue is placed in temples and prayers from the Bonobibi Johur Nama are read by people of all, by people of all religions before they go into the Sundarbans to cut wood, um, to cut wood or fish or gather honey. Honey is the premier uh, export, I guess, out of the Sundarbans area because it is um, very difficult to collect and extremely expensive. So they get the most revenue out of doing that. Now an integral part of the Bono Bibi culture is the establishment of a statue or photo of Bono Bibi at her khan or temple. So here you have two pictures of Bono Bibi. She's the goddess um, uh, who's in the center over here. Now, idol worship is common against, uh, common amongst Hindus, but it's taboo to Muslims. However, Bono Bibi's Muslim images right here are, um, uh, See, this is one of um, Bonu Bibi's Muslim images, and she is, um, as you can see, her. She's found with braided hairs. So that's her braid. Those are her braids. I don't know. If my, oh, there. Those are her braids. Um, she wears a cap, and instead of a sari, she wears a blouse and a salwar. Whereas her predominantly Hindu images, it's on the left side of the screen are found wearing a sari, uh, a crown, and a garland. And she carries a trident, she rides a tiger. So the practice of chanting the name of God when adversity strikes is traceable to the Hindu Vaishnav belief in Nama. It is also a Sufi practice 
uh, believed to connect a devotee with the divine. Now the Johur Nama um, is a fusion of Bengali, Hindu, traditional literary genres, the Panchali form in this case, with personal Arabic Islamic literary genres, uh, Kissa or Kitcha in this way. So the Johur Nama is um, the text from which Bono Bibi's uh, story, uh, it, it contains Bono Bibi's story and it, uh, is this te uh, it, the verses from the text are recited before the um, people going to the jungle. So ultimately the divine power itself, despite belonging to a formed idol is traceable to the prophet that's and his daughter Bonabibi. Um, so my Rajasthani con consultants, like I had said previously, had migrated. Uh, well, uh, they had migrated from a central Indian state, and at some point, they had converted to Islam. And their daily practices were a fusion of the ancestral Hindu practices with some Islamic ones. Whereas in Bengal, the communities in the Sundarbans area retain their religious identities as Hindus or Muslims, etc. Yet their need for survival had resulted in a religious syncretic practice. During colonial times, one of the primary migration patterns in India was from Western India to, to the East, where merchants, traders, and administrators were being drawn from Western states primarily Rajasthan, Punjab, and Maharashtra, and they were going to Bengal, where the British were headquartered. The possibility of improving their economic status, uh, they were going to improve their economic status by finding work in the tea estates, as well as in the industrial and urban development of the cities. Uh, and most of the people who were going uh, for the industrial urban development in tea states were just subsistence wage earners. The intermingling of these migrant communities led to the modification of sociocultural and religious practices. And these practices were voiced in the music and the tales of these communities. Uh, my future research will entail seeking folk tales and folk music along migration routes used by herders, tradesmen, etc., to identify what aspects of host community cultures versus migrant community practices were adopted and carried forward leading to syncretic cultural practices. And I will start that work when I return my next Fulbright um, this coming April. Thank you everybody for your attention and I really appreciate being here. So thank you, thank you Manali and congratulations for your next Fulbright. And now that we have all our speakers presented that insightful um, um, topics, we will now ask the full panel to come on our q &A segment of this session. So please um, have you be seen and then we have excellent questions. Yes, we have a number of questions first. I want to begin a question to Carol. This is from Alex. Mm -hmm. And could you please describe the extent to which the local teachers embraced puppet technology for teacher learning and development? Okay. I found that people initially who were very shy, but because of the strategies that I use, I was able to get them engaged. Everybody, let's try something. All right, everybody, take up your hand. I'll show you some of the strategies that loosen people up. Take up your hand and make it into a puppet. Ready? Okay. Now, everybody, sway, 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 sway. Everybody, hop, hop, hop. Okay, now your puppet is a really scary bear. Say hello like a scary bear. Hello, everybody. Hello. hello. And now you're a very timid, squeaky pig. Everybody say hello like a squeaky pig. Squeak, hello, 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 hello. Okay, then 
what I would do is <clears throat> after they loosened up and acted silly, and of course I use music with some of these things, I divided everybody into teams of two. So like, um, Jay, you might be with Karen, Michelle, you might be with Jonathan, Miriman, you might be with me. And I would give you each a task and I would say something like, um, okay, you got one, a one minute skit that is going to tell the story of something related to traffic safety like why you should wait for the light to turn green. To somebody else, I might say, why you need to brush your teeth. For somebody else, why you should only drink clean water or why you should do your homework. So by dividing people into teams of two, they're only with one other person and then letting them share their skit with another team of two, it loosened them up to be able to scare, to um, share. Then I would ask for volunteers who would be happy to do it for the whole class. The important thing to do is to remember that you are not the puppet. It's no longer you. The puppet is something else and it can make mistakes. It can say goofy things. It is not a reflection on you. And that's the power of having everybody make a puppet. The puppet, I didn't do it. The puppet did it. So that frees them to tell all kinds of stories. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for an excellent answer. Thank you, Carol. Now this question is to Karen and of course, Michelle can jump in. But the idea of the arts-based resilience building, I feel it's a great idea. And I think um, this is for global, the young women and development, uh, in Global South. So please explain how one could approach those who are not that experienced as both of you are. And this is an excellent idea of building resilience, especially with young women in the Global South. How do you do it? Thank you so much for that um, for that question. It's I just happen to have this amazing book right on my desk, and I'll put the title in the chat. But it says "Theater for Community Conflict and Dialogue," and was written by a man named Michael Rode when he was working with people who are HIV positive and using theater as a way to not only um, process through the the challenges of everyday life and their and their traumas, but also um, as a way to sort of reframe and reinvent um, themselves as being being empowered um, with with their with their identity, with who they were as people, having their full humanity intact. So I would in, I would recommend this text for anybody. You don't have to be a, a theater person. It's this incredible kind of how to when you want to use theater as a tool to engage with communities to put the communities as the central stakeholders so that they're really determining and articulating what it is that they want to use theater to engage with. Um, yeah, I, Michael Road is he's amazing. The, the, another kind of little small world story is that Lucy, who you saw in the video, is um, at Arizona State and Michael Road is on faculty there. And so she's really excited to be able to take a, a class with him. Um, so that is one thing that I would suggest. And then the other kind of similar to what Carol was saying, is that finding ways to build an, an ethos of trust with the, the collaborative community and that to find really small step ways so that the word theater and performance are not these sort of scary um, separate things, but they just become part of the playmaking and the joy that we do all the time when we're sharing our experiences with, with one another. Um, yeah. So that would be another thing I would suggest. Yeah. I, I would echo that and just add that really this is about the process. It's not about the product. So it's the process that we celebrate. The product was great too, but that's where our focus was. Yeah, I quite agree. Um, the comment, it is more also, it's about the process. Now for both of you, and the video that you showed, and I looked at the um, chat, there are many that say, wow, that's a great video. It showed about the Kenya, about the group singing and so forth. Is it possible that video can be shared? Or is it something 
uh, is a proprietary video, it has a copyright or some sort, uh, you may want to think about uh, how uh, that can be done. And I, I do not know the, the, uh, the sharing that video, you may want to think about, or do you have any comments on that? I would welcome anyone who's interested in that to email me. Um, at, I'm at James Madison University in Virginia, and um, I put my email address uh, in, in the chat. I can do that again. Uh, just email me and I'll talk with the producer and we'll figure out how to make that happen. Okay, uh, thank you, Michelle. And here's a question for Jonathan. By the way, Jonathan is an Emmy nominated filmmaker and the founder of the Change Works. And he has other accolades and it'll take too much for me time to read. There's a question that how did you get interested in doing such a successful documentaries? And uh, this is about following uh, um, and the, the people through the years. And uh, it's also five continents. It, it's not only challenging, but I know it is very creative. And please share with us your story, personal story. Well, thank you for those uh, generous uh, uh, comments. I think, uh, you know, to your point about like how you get involved or why or getting involved in uh, creating, quote, successful documentaries. I, mean, I don't think um, anyone really, well, I, I don't really set out to make uh, successful yeah. documentaries. I. I I uh, intend to follow questions or uh, investigations that are of particular concern to me. And uh, usually they're not of interest to mainstream audiences necessarily. And we do the best we can to uh, have them distributed as widely as possible. And we've been reasonably successful in getting the films uh, on a wide range of subjects from mental health that we um, I showed a film a uh, clip on earlier to uh, the second film I made was about American politics. Uh, and then we, we made a film about Islamic fundamentalism in Pakistan and the most recent one. Uh, we also showed a clip from, I mean, there've been another of other shorter projects, but I, I think, you know, I gravitated toward making films of the kind that I like to see, which was following people's lives unfold over yeah. time and uh, experiencing that in real time. They're um, very challenging projects to make because they um, take a big investment up front in building this, apropos of this panel. And then a lot of time spent um, just with the people coming while you're not over a period of years. And, um, you know, that's what I've, I've tried to make in my career rather than simply interview based or um, yeah. other types of documentaries that are much more common. But I, I um, think we should go to another question, but uh, you know, that's, that's basic summary of uh, why I do what I do and how I've done yeah. it. It's a quick follow-up on, I'm sure you have a support from BBC, BPS, and of course, Netflix and Ford Foundation and one of your interesting subjects, I would rather not use the word subject, the people, is the Marshall Gua. And um, um, I, I think tell us a little bit about, because the stage name being Babe, uh, I, I think that's one of your very successful documentary, I believe, is it? Or, and you showed us the clip we certainly hope so. Uh, this is a film that just came out this year at Tribeca yeah. Film Festival. And uh, to give all the work credit to the director of the film as well, yeah. who um, was on this project for fully 15 years. I, I've been on this project only for only 11 years. So it's, um, you know, quite a long-term project. Uh, we do follow people over time. And this is both of our, I, I think, longest project with a colleague as well, yeah. um, Mark mentioned before too. Um, okay. One you. of our most successful projects. I, I, I think, you know, we've gotten into about 25 film festivals and 
I think we're shooting for uh, a mainstream release on television and otherwise uh, Pride Month next year, June 2022. If people are watching this on YouTube uh, nearer to that time and want to look at television listings, I don't think we have anything I can announce now, but um, certainly we will before long. And thank you for your question, Jay. Yeah, you're welcome. And here's a question for Renalini, I think that the idea of uh, syncretism is uh, very relevant uh, increasingly. And you find not just the border states, if I may, but even New York City may have pockets of syncretism uh, um, taking, well, then how, do you uh, relate or your comment about major cities uh, even London or New York cities, uh, does this syncretism play out in the um, urban cities? Um, Jay, thank you for that. Uh, I, in India, I haven't um, seen as, I personally have not uh, encountered it. I'm sure it's there uh, j just because you know, Indian, in Indian cities, communities just live so much closer together. There's just no way that they will not influence each other uh, and their lives. But uh, most of the work I have done uh, has been focused on rural areas in India and um, rural cultures. And um, there has, it, it's very, very prevalent um and and i think more so in the in the villages and rural areas than in uh cities and cities people tend to be more isolated um and uh as a matter of fact one of uh, the driver that i used to go to the village um where i was speaking to uh one of the storytellers was really, really angry at this community for dressing and behaving like a Hindu, like Hindus, because they were Muslims. And um, that was that was probably actually my very first trigger mm -hmm. that he was so angry about it. And I said, why are you so angry? So how dare they do that? And I said, what difference does it make how they dress and they behave? Um, you know, it, it's all part of being people and, you know, but in any case, um, it, it's, yeah, yeah, I, I haven't seen it in cities, but definitely something I'd love to explore further. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the answer. And here's a question for Karen and Michelle. Do you also use any of Augusto Bull's concept of theater? of the oppressed in your work? Um, yes, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Um, so mostly forum theater, uh, if you're familiar with Augusta Bawal. Augusta Bawal is just an amazing revolutionary in theater, using theater as a tool for literacy engagement with um, indigenous yeah. populations in, in Brazil. Uh, he was a student of, or, or, or contemporary of Paolo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And so Theater of the Oppressed comes directly from that. In any case, so absolutely, we spend uh, in the class, I was talking about a, a good amount of time exploring Bawal's um, techniques and methods. And I actually just had a, a meeting with a group of Kenyans a couple days ago. Uh, we're doing a forum theater, theater project on police relationships between Kenyans and, and their community, um, incidences of police brutality that have just, um, been occurring um, more readily during the COVID lockdowns. Um, and so we'll be developing some curriculum using uh, Theater of the Oppressed in, in that. Oh, th thank you. Uh, by the way, um, just for the audience, um, Carol Sterling is the recipient of the Distinguished Service for Arts Education Award presented by the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts and uh, well-deserved. And after uh, listening and her being with us, there's no surprise 
And <laughs> yeah, Jay, that was for arts education advocacy, the importance of having the arts in all the schools in America. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you for correcting me. Um, Carol, I mean, you also spend time in training and you gave us a demonstration. And um, you have any special countries or culture and you responded to one of the, the chat that the cultural challenges are opportunities. Now you see them as opportunities and I'm sure Karen, Michelle, they're also see, I'm sure um, uh, Jonathan and um, all of you, not only very creative, artistic. And um, yes, but some of them even in the classroom to engage very diversify, very, I mean, uh, you find multicultural, um, diverse the student population, they find it challenging sometimes. So what is your advice to them? Or any of you can, uh, even uh, all of you respond well, to that. I'm just gonna uh, say that by bringing objects to life, puppet artists, when you, puppeteers can penetrate linguistic and cultural barriers to tell stories that are accessible to people around the world. You're given permission to break those barriers. So I think it's a, just as everybody has elaborated on how they tell stories, puppets provide us with, and, and uh, it's really a wonderful way of kind of demystifying the process of telling a story and becoming another character. I, I'd be interested in hearing other folks' interpretation as well. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I'm opening up, looking at another Q&A. And um, here's a question. Um, unfortunately, Sharon Smith, unable to be with us. Um, um, and her topic, uh, just uh, all of you know, we had her presence. And is it navigating narratives, reclaiming stories, humanizing through a translingual story studio. That's another creative, um, um, her work, and I'm sure she continues to be doing that. And it is very transnational and also uh, forging global friendships. Um, so given all this and um, um, anybody, you have your own, um, any uh, questions to each other or it's, uh, we, we still have about a couple of minutes left. Um, and Jonathan, what is your ongoing project? And uh, you live in Brooklyn. And I, I suppose the major, major time that you spend in New York City around. Uh, well, I'm, I'm in Europe at the moment. So um, not, not in New York City at the moment, but yeah, we do live in Brooklyn. Um, I, um, what can I say? I'm not really at liberty to speak about my main current project. Like a lot of us are at, at times um, before something is announced or uh, public. But I think, uh, you know, one thing I've been working on for a long time, which I think is really in touch with a lot of what the panelists uh, other than me are also working on is uh, dialogue work. Uh, we're working on an educational platform um, called the uh, Reality Check platform that I had a fellowship to develop at the uh, uh, Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY uh, a couple of years ago, um, following using this new platform we developed, uh, which creates episodic versions of films with uh, uh, info um, data commercial breaks in between the um, episodes of films presented literally where people have their chance to talk back to the film and tell what they think about social issues and what's happening in the films. And at the same time, in real time, find out what everyone else thinks so that we can facilitate discussion based on how differently people are viewing 
uh, films because you know we're really not in a time when everybody is seeing things in the same way. We're in a very siloed media environment. So yeah. we're creating this uh, tool for educators um, yeah. to uh, dialogue uh, better through film because using film in the classroom has really not changed in the last 50 years. So, you know, watch the space, I guess, for that and uh, mm -hmm. our current films when they're um, more uh, able to be announced. But thank you for the question again, Jay. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. It's absolutely what you just um, um, not only uh, um, discussed uh, several times during and also in the Q&A. Jay, yeah, yeah, I just wanted to let you know that Merlon yeah, I think Merlani we're has her out of time, but um, uh, that's all the time we have for questions. Oh, sorry, Thank Jay. You, uh, sorry, Jay. All of our speakers. Jay, 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 one second. Yeah. Um, Renalini has her hand up just for a comment. Oh, I'm then, sorry, go ahead, Molly. Oh, it's actually, it was just a quick question, Carolyn. I can ask for later also. It, it was. No, no, no. We have time about a minute or left. Yeah. Okay. It was just whether, Carol, whether you had interacted with puppeteers, uh, the traditional puppeteers in India. I didn't know which part of India you, it looked like you were in Bengal. Um, I worked in five cities in India. And I ended up meeting puppeteers in the South, Kerala, um, the North, Delhi, um, Tripura, uh, Agartala. And wherever I went, I was hosted by a puppeteer company. And I usually um, taught their puppeteers how to use puppetry in education, because most of them, as you can imagine, are performers. And I always, integrated the kinds of stories that they told to their children in the, the work that I did with the teachers. So that, yes, I always, I did a lot of research on the traditions, the various kinds of traditions in Indian culture. And when I was in Uganda, I have to tell you it was the opposite because there wasn't even a word for the word puppet and their language, which is Buganda. So they'd say, Puppet, what's a puppet? Yeah, there really wasn't a word. So it was a completely different experience in each country. Yes. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, indeed, thank you for the question, Manali. And Jonathan just posted a chat. Yeah, there should be a way where we can get to share the work from uh, 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 Sharon Smith, who is, who is unfortunately her flight was delayed. And we'll find a way to uh, share, get her work, uh, at least um, as many who are interested in, uh, and to share what she's, what she's doing. Now, I think that's all we have the time. And again, I thank all of you for your excellent presentations. And thank you for the, uh, for the audience and everyone who have, have attended for this exciting session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you fellow panelists. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Great work. Thank you.